gout and the alcohol effect and we start right now. Hi, I'm Dr. Pete. I have a PhD in biochemistry. I'm also a nutrition network coach practitioner and a primal health coach. Alcohol influences the potential of a gout flare in three fundamental ways. The way alcohol does this is by feeding into a biochemical driver, which is called the survival switch, characterized by Dr. Richard Johnson in hundreds of publications and over a few decades of work, depicted here on the first slide. Now I have addressed the issue of alcohol before and that video is linked above. As you look at this slide, you can see that the core element of this biochemical driver is fructose metabolism. And as I've talked about in the past in several presentations, we have the interaction of the deadly triad. And in this, in this context, we're going to talk about the liver. But in the back of your mind, be thinking of chondrocyte within the joint because it's the chondrocyte that is influencing the potential of whether or not you have a gout flare or not. So when we look at this diagram, we see that when the deadly triad, that would be alcohol, hyperglycemia, and exogenous fructose from the diet. When the metabolism is activated, the fructose metabolism is activated, we see a massive depletion in ATP, along with a massive depletion in phosphate with an inverse relationship, sudden acute rise in uric acid, intracellular uric acid, and this is driving systemic inflammation, disruption of the nitric oxide pathway, and the stimulation of de novo lipogenesis, the formation of oil droplets, and also the, the transportation of triglycerides to adipose tissue. When I have spoken in the past about the effect of alcohol on fructose metabolism, I have focused on alcohol's effect on aldose reductase. And that's where we're gonna start today, except we're gonna go into a much deeper dive on this, very complex, so hold on to your hats. In this next slide, you're looking at a more complex rendition of the survival switch and pause the video for a second and look at the numbering because now what we're going to talk about are the effects of alcohol but also there is some new science in regard to pyruvate that we need to discuss that fits into this scenario. Firstly, remember that ethanol activates aldose reductase so that if there is hyperglycemia, in other words, if there is a high concentration of glucose present, then in the presence of alcohol, aldose reductase is going to be activated, and that glucose, much of that glucose, up to 30% of it, is going to be pushed into endogenous fructose. So the question becomes, how is alcohol actually activating aldose reductase? And as you might expect, there's some controversy about that. One option is that the ethanol itself is involved in the activation of aldose reductase. A second option for which there is some data for is that a transcription factor called NFAT5 is activated and actually upregulates the genes that produce or that code for aldose reductase so that we end up with more aldose reductase enzymes in the cytoplasm, thereby being able to process more glucose into the polyol pathway. Thirdly, there is some data that suggests that acetaldehyde, which is the toxic aldehyde that is produced in the process of converting alcohol eventually to acetate, and you can see those reactions on the right side of the slide. And that acid al um, excuse me, acid aldehyde may be involved actually in the activation of aldose reductase. Remember that in the process of activating aldose reductase by alcohol, that there is a need that the polyol pathway actually have substrate. And that's why hyperglycemia 
in the presence of the alcohol, those, those two things together work to produce endogenous fructose in, in the two-step polyol reaction. First, the conversion to sorbitol, and then the con conversion of sorbitol to endogenous fructose. Now we shift to number two, and this is the issue of the hyperglycemia. Not only is it contributing to pushing the polyol pathway to endogenous fructose, but because we have a hyperglycemic condition, an excess of glucose, the met metabolic pathway glycolysis is operating at its highest rate, and the various steps are completely full, which means that we have a pool of pyruvate sitting on the end of the pathway. Now, when you look at the slide, which is number three for pyruvate, you can see that there are two sets of arrows. There's a single arrow that cuts away from pyruvate towards acetate, and then there is a double arrow that leads down to lactate. So we're going to talk more about lactate in a minute in regard to how ethanol is actually broken down from, from ethanol to acetaldehyde to acetate. But for a moment, we want to focus on the transition from pyruvate to acetate. And this is where the new science comes in. Remember, we have hyperglycemia going on. Glycolysis is completely full. There's a pool of pyruvate that is in equilibrium with lactate, it's important to recognize that that ratio is a ratio that's somewhere between seven to 10 to one. So seven, seven fold lactate to one pyruvate, but the two things are in equilibrium. The new science is showing that in the case of pooled pyruvate, we also have a significant chemical reaction that quantitatively converts some of that pyruvate directly into acetate. And it does this through two different pathways. One pathway is non-enzymatic and is dependent on reactive oxygen species. And the other pathway is indeed enzymatic and depends on dehydrogenases that are specific for molecules like pyruvate that have an acetate functional group attached to the main part of the molecule. And that's what we're going to focus on now because acetate, turn, as it turns out, is a really important molecule in this process or contribution of alcohol to a sudden acute rise in uric acid and downstream the, the gout effect. So one thing I, I forgot to mention is in the transition from pyruvate to acetate in the non-enzymatic reaction. I mentioned reactive oxygen species. And if you're wondering where those came from, remember that in the background of this, we have fructose metabolism going on with a high uh, acute rise in uric acid, which is generating the systemic inflammation and reactive oxygen species. That's where the source is to drive, at least on one of the reactions, the pyruvate to the acetate. Now let's turn to the transformation of alcohol or ethanol, to be more correct, to acetate. So number four, upper right hand side of the slide, you can see that ethanol is transformed into acetate in two steps. In the first step, we have the transformation from ethanol to acetaldehyde by the enzyme alcohol dehydrogenase. The first step takes place in the cytoplasm, and then the acid aldehyde makes its way into the mitochondria, where it will be converted to acetate by aldehyde dehydrogenase. Note that both steps produce NADH, and you can think of NADH as being molecular money, and that molecular money is utilized by the cell, and now we want to track back left across the slide to pyruvate in equilibrium with lactate. That NADH is now going to drive that equilibrium towards lactate so that the ratio of lactate to pyruvate is greater than 10 to 1. When the lactate is in excess, some of it 
is going to exit the cell into the circulatory system where it makes its way to the kidneys. Lactate is an organic acid and will directly compete for excretion or secretion into the urine with uric acid. So this is the second place that alcohol has an extraordinary effect on the rise in uric acid. It should be noted that within minutes of an individual drinking alcohol, we will see the appearance of large quantities of acetate within liver cells. Once we have produced the acetate, it is converted both inside the mitochondria and within the cytoplasm into adenosine and also uric acid. And now we are going to turn to that subject. This slide demonstrates the two-step reaction to get from acetate to acetyl-CoA. Very important reaction happens in the cytoplasm and also inside the mitochondria and is catalyzed by acetyl-CoA synthetase. You can see there are three effects of this. The formation of uric acid, also the formation of adenosine, and also the activation of de novo lipogenesis, or fat, new fat accumulation. To summarize the acetate effect, we have de novo lipogenesis that feeds into the de novo lipogenesis, which is already occurring due to the fructose metabolism and the acute rise in uric acid. The uric acid spike that happens within the mitochondria during the acetate metabolism directly dysregulates the mitochondria. It is known that adenosine operates intracellularly and also extracellularly. And in the case of the acetate reaction, there will be pooled adenosine that will be transported into the circulatory system where it will make its way to a lot of different tissues, but one of those tissues in particular will be the brain. And in the brain, adenosine signaling will lead to a sedating effect, effects on GABA, and contribute to adaption and withdrawal from the alcohol. Acetate is a similar situation. When it's produced in excess, it's going to be transported into the circulatory system where it makes its way to the brain. And in the brain, acetate can be used as an energy source, but it also has similar signaling effects like that of adenosine. Additionally, thinking about cravings and sugar addiction, I recently published a video that outlined the signaling system and the food reward system and the relationships of that to the survival switch. And now with our basic model, including the effects of acetate and adenosine, it makes it easier to understand why some of us have a hard time giving up sugar and alcohol. Thank you for watching my presentation, and if this is the first time that you've joined us, please hit the subscribe button and the bell next to it so you know the next time when I publish a video.